Well, uh, the fundamental revelation of the Bible um, is that we have a father and we have a king, right? God is a father to us and God is also a king. And uh, you have an identity that's, that's found um, that in, in God where you are a child of God. And a child of God, you are his representative, you are his ambassador, Okay, you are also called to be, uh, this little different language, a warrior in his kingdom, a spiritual warrior in his kingdom, and to actually overcome the darkness of this world with the power of the king. And this power comes from your relationship with the father. It comes from your acceptance of the authority of the king and the acceptance of your place in his plan to do that. You know, in, in our day, um, I, I don't think our, our age is any different than any other age. Um, as, as Christians, oftentimes we complain and we worry about just how bad the world is. Um, last night, Nina and I were at the mall on a Saturday night. I have not been to the mall on a Saturday night for maybe 10 years. You know, we just don't go over there. The mall on Saturday night was, wow, that was, um, I really struggled with, I mean, this is terrible. What, where did all these people come from? Is this what the world looks like? Look at these people, you know? And it's, and it's like, wow, we got to do something. We're losing this world, you know? And, and, and you see them walk by, and it's like, wow, I don't like feeling that way. And, and yet it's so easy to get there, and you see things on TV, and you see things that are happening, and you go, you know, we need to get a compound someplace and 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 retreat and get away from all this junk, you know, and just wait for Jesus to come because this is nuts what's going on. Do you ever get that way? I think we all do. And the thing is, is that that's such a passive stance. That's just, you know, looking at them and then, you know, yeah, there's some judgment in there. You're looking at them, you're going, oh man, this this is getting bad. It's much worse than what I thought it was. And But I'm not going to do anything about it other than to identify it, you see. And we do nothing because our identity, um, you know, it's, it's just all messed up. The revelation of the Bible is that we are, in fact, a child of God, and we are a representative of the king, and he's given us this royal robe of the king. We are his sons and daughters, and we are his ambassadors in this world. And if we don't push back the darkness or bring light to this darkness, then who's going to do it? But you see, we, we don't walk in that too much. We, I'm, I'm so good at criticizing, but I'm not so good at walking in that. Today, um, up until today, we talked about the story of Abraham and Sarah, right? And how God cut this covenant with them. And then we looked at Joseph and the kingdom story of how God used his for him for his plan. And today we're going to turn to uh, the story of Moses, and we see that he's both a, a man of the covenant, but he's also a man of the kingdom, and both are present. And uh, we picked this up 400 years after last week. It's been 400 years now. Joseph's family moved down to Egypt, and there God blessed them, and they lived in this place. Kind of, you know, I always call it San Diego. Goshen is this really nice place, kind of tropical, you know, like Pharaoh's living up in L.A., and and uh, and uh, the Hebrews are down there in, in San Diego. It's a nice wind all the time and palm trees and all this stuff, you know. And they, they, they did what God told them to do, be fruitful and multiply. And they're quite happy until it says, And there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. You know this is going to go south, right? 400 years, and now there's, there's this Pharaoh that doesn't know anything about the Joseph story. So what is at issue was that the Israelites had prospered so much that they, the Egyptians began to fear them because there were so many of them and their wealth had grown so much. And they, you know, they've got these, these immigrants that have lived with them now for 400 years, but they're, they're huge in number. So Pharaoh, he has this plan of a little population control and he orders all the midwives, you know this story, all the midwives to um, kill, wow, kill all the, the males, the male children, Jewish male children as they're born, and they turn the Israelites into slaves, and they no longer have this status, um, 
you know, this preferred status, but now they are slaves of the Egyptians. And you know the story of Moses. Moses' mother uh, gives birth to him, says he's a beautiful baby, and she, you know, she hides him for three months. This is, we tell our children this in Sunday school. This, this whole story is just rather gruesome, if you know what I mean. They're killing all the baby boys, <laughs> and Moses is spared, and his mother puts him in the little basket and puts tar on it and puts him out of the Nile, and he's floating around this little basket, you know, and he's crying, and, and uh, Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the Nile uh, to bathe, and she sees the baby, and she, she likes him, so she takes him home, and he's raised up in Pharaoh's court which means that he's raised in the household of the wealthiest, most powerful man in the world right then. So he has this great education, and he has all this privilege. And, you know, Egypt is at its prime. Uh, We're talking, I think, around probably about 1500 B.C. So the pyramids were only 1,000 years old then. You know, they're still real shiny and stuff, maybe. I don't know. But but anyway, th- things are just really, you know, Egypt's on top of the world. And um, Moses, he has all this freedom and all this power, and he knows that he's a Hebrew. And, and one day, he's 40 years old, and he sees, you know, the story goes, he sees a, an Egyptian uh, labor boss beating a Hebrew. And Moses' justice meter just kind of pegs over, you know, and he kills this guy, kills the Egyptian. And news spreads around the community, and he knows that, uh, and, and Pharaoh hears it, and he knows that he's, he's got to leave town. So um, he, he flees to the desert of Midian. And the story of Moses is the story, I think, of everyone's life if we wake up to see it. First, we get blessed. We receive from God what is not ours, and his grace finds us, and then as as Moses, you know, we're found in the bulrushes, so to speak, in, in life. And then in time, we get broken. And we, we considered last week the story of Joseph, remember, uh, that God was in the breaking, that God was in his fall. God was the one that sent him into prison. And this fall into weakness and brokenness is from God's hand as well. And then in time, we're used by God, blessed by God broken by God, and then used by God. And we may be looking at this and thinking, well, I've not been used yet. Well, maybe you're in the blessed stage, or maybe you're in the broken stage. Maybe maybe you're in this time of preparation. But, uh, you know, we have faith that God has blessed us, and then God is, he will break us. And then he will use us, and that's what happened to Moses and every man and woman that God uses. And we see in chapter 3 of Exodus that he he doesn't just go a short uh, ways into the desert. Um, He could have just, you know, crossed over the Nile there and uh, gone into the the desert area, but he doesn't. He, He goes all the way across the Sinai Peninsula, and he goes into the land of Midian, it says, and that's a long ways away. That's way over where Jordan is today. And he's much further than what's necessary for him to go to be safe. Um, but the desert in the Bible is always stands for our dependency on God. Anytime that someone ends up in the desert, it means that they need to learn and need to embrace their dependency on God. And up until this point, uh, Moses had been free and he had authority and then his, his uh, righteous indignation, his anger takes over, his sense of justice, and away he goes into the desert, which is that place of weakness, that place where he's broken, that place where he learns how to depend on God. And out there in the desert, Moses ends up watching the sheep of Jethro, who is his new father-in-law. And you, we can see just how much life has changed for him. I mean, he went from the palace of the ruler of the most prosperous, important nation at that time in the world to a marriage to a lady that we'd probably call her Zippy. I think she had to be English. Her name actually was Ziphora. I'm sure they called her Zippy, don't you think? Who's going to call her? I think she's English. I don't know. I'm just being funny. But, But he's married to a lady named Zippy. 
and he's watching sheep and goats all day. Now that's quite that's quite a fall from from Pharaoh's palace to living with the sheep and the goats in Zippy. It's then that we read at the end of Exodus 2. And here we are, Exodus 2, 23 to 25. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and God saw the people of Israel And God knew. I love that phrase. God heard. God remembered. And and remembered here doesn't mean that God had forgotten. God doesn't, God's old, but God doesn't forget anything, right? Doesn't forget this. Remembered here is is in the same way it's used when it says that God will not remember our sins against us, is that God remembered here means that God is getting ready to act on, on what he has already promised. And so uh, it means that he felt what his people were feeling uh, because, uh, remember, they're in covenant with God and a father knows the pain of the children. And where they went, he went. And where he went, they went. And so he hears their cries and it comes up to him and God is now ready to act. And then hundreds of miles away from, the, from Egypt, from Goshen, uh, Moses finds the mountain of God. And I always thought this was so interesting. He, he doesn't find the mountain of God, you see, when he's in the palace. He finds the mountain of God when he's out in the desert. When he's been humbled and he's out here in the de- desert, uh, he found the mountain of God. And, you know, this he's in this place where God is all he has. He has to depend upon the Lord. This is all that Moses has. And then he finds the mountain of God. And he found the mountain of God when he's ready. Almost 40 years has passed. Now Moses is getting, you know, he's been out in the desert for almost 40 years and he's getting close to age 80. And that's a lot of goat time, isn't it? 40 years of watching goats. and 40 years of eating Zippy's cooking, you know. Out, out in the desert. Zephyr's not in a very good light in the Bible, if you get my, my joke here. She really isn't seen in very good light. But he didn't find the mountain of God the first year he was there. He found the mountain of God the 40th year that he's there. And it means that God is ready to do something. And God has been preparing him. And preparation takes time. Dependency is a slow path. Dependency on God is a slow path. Losing our self-importance, that doesn't happen immediately. Remember, Abraham waited 25 years from the time that God gave him the promise of the son to the day that he received the son. Yeah, I've got trouble waiting two minutes. I don't know about you. 25 years, 40 years. Last, year, last week, Joseph was in prison 13 years waiting for God's promise to come to him. That's a long time. King David, we think, was probably about the same amount of time, probably about 13 to 15 years to actually become king from the time that he was anointed to be king. And all the time, God is preparing these men to be used. You know, it's, it's so easy to get, you, we can get puffed up in just a second. Someone says something good about me, and I'm just, right? It just, it just takes a moment to, 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 get, to get puffed up. But for that to come out takes a long time. It, it, preparation here. And God prepares every person that he uses. God prepares us to be used by him in a different way than we would think. God prepares our, our spiritual strength. And, and that's much different than our mental and our physical strength. Uh, spiritual strength is different. You know, we're starting to watch the Olympics right now. And you, we'll hear all these stories um, very few of these Olympic stars just decided last year that they would be an Olympian. Most of them started when they were little children, especially the gymnasts. I mean, they start when they're just this big, you know, training, or the ice skaters. They, they don't just suddenly say, eh, I think I can do that, I can get some skates, and, you know, get, get some skis and jump off the top. Who knows what might happen? No, there's years of preparation that they go through. And we'll see these stories about these kids that grow up and then, you know, in just a split second, something happens and it's all over. Just, you know, 
the, 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 the knee blows out or whatever. And it's, just, and it's just gone. And we think, wow, the dedication that they've had, the training that they've gone through. Listen, spiritual preparation is more difficult than physical preparation. It really is because it's kind of intangible. We, we can't see the results immediately. It's hard for us to identify the fruit that come from our spiritual growth. But it's much more difficult for God to prepare us, to humble us and prepare us to be used by him. Much more difficult than it is for us to grow big muscles or learn some skills on the ice. This is spiritual preparation. And Moses is 80 years old. And he's not spiritually ready until he's 80. And the people that he's going to be used for are not ready until he's 80. And at age 80, you see, physically, he's he's not as as capable. Mentally, he's not as capable. Okay? But spiritually, now he's ready. You see that? He's ready for God to use him. It's got nothing to do with age. Some people are are, are very young when they're ready. I've I've known, you know, teenagers that were spiritually mature. They're They're just empty of themselves and they're ready to be used. And then some of us old people still aren't ready. It's a different kind of preparation. So we come to chapter three. And God came to Moses, as we know, in the fire, in the burning bush. And and God speaks to Moses. Um, from the fire about the covenant. Exodus 3, 6 to 7. And he said, is God speaking out of the bush? And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And God tells him, he says, your identity comes from me, Father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's your identity. See, I'm the God of your fathers. They are the fathers because I'm in covenant. Okay? And God says to Moses, you are mine, is what he's saying here. they're, They're your fathers. You're in covenant. You're in that covenant line. And I have the same relationship with you that I had with them. And then God says, I've seen my people. See, <laughs> it's, it's been 400 years that they've been in Egypt, but they're still God's people. I'm their God because I have a covenant with them, and I am sending you, Moses, to do the work of my kingship. And then God tells Moses some of the great things that he's going to do through him and you know, all of this display of power. And, and Moses says, uh, not me. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, anyone else but me. That's his first response. You see, Moses has been a long time of preparation, but he doesn't know he's ready. Moses doesn't know it himself. So God, and maybe that's that's one of the prerequisites for us to be ready to be used by God is to perhaps not know that we're ready to be used by God. Because with that that knowing that we're ready, there's just a little bit of arrogance in there, see? So he says, no, anyone else but me. So God is speaking to him from this burning bush, and God gives him this vision. He gives him this foretaste of what he wants to do. And God says, what's in your hand, Moses? Moses says, a stick, you know, a staff. God says, throw it down. He throws it down. It turns into a snake. God says, pick it up. And he picks up the snake, and it turns into his staff. And God says, see, you are an extension of my authority and power. I'm going to do through you, okay? You are going to be my flesh. You are going to be my representative here. And that's just kind of a teaser, Moses, of the kind of things that I'm going to do. So then there's this bargaining back and forth between God and Moses. And and remember, Moses can do that just like (laughs) some of his predecessors had done, like Abraham had done. And he can do that because... He, he realizes his covenant relationship, it's a they thing, it's, it's us together. He knows he's dealing with God Almighty, and yet he has negotiations with God. And what they decide, what Moses and God decide together, is that Moses will go and represent God, but his brother Aaron will kind of be his, his agent and his marketing manager, let's call it. you know. And Moses said, 
can Aaron speak for me? Because I don't want to do that. I, I don't. And God says, well, okay. So the picture is, is that God says something to, to Moses, and then Moses tells Aaron, and Aaron says, thus saith the Lord. And everybody goes, oh, isn't Aaron great? He's so wonderful. Moses is so lucky to have him as a brother. You know, that's kind of the way that whole thing goes. And Moses says, that's the way I want it. So Moses goes in to confront the kingdom of Pharaoh, and he goes to confront and defeat. And there's this pantheon of gods that stand behind the throne of Egypt. And Moses arrives, and he says, let my people go. He's speaking for God, and he's representing the sovereign God and the people of Israel. And the people know, um, now they number at least a million people, the Israelites, and he doesn't ask Pharaoh, but he commands Pharaoh in the name of God. And you know the drill. Pharaoh hardens his heart, and he won't let them go. And so there's uh, plague after plague. The, the Nile turns to, to blood, and the, the sky grows dark, and there's you know frogs in your soup, and there's boils on your back, and there's gnats in your eyes and all this stuff. And they have this this um, battle going back and forth until finally it comes to the last plague, which is the death of the firstborn son, which is this direct defeat of Pharaoh because it means the death of his son. And his son is the representation of Pharaoh's God. He's the heir apparent. So we have them what's known as the Passover in chapter 12 and we get this other covenant picture this doorway of blood and just remember like the path of blood that that Abraham passed through and the two the corridors now we have this doorway that's covered in the blood and all the Hebrews that go in and out of this house through this doorway have the protection of the Lord and and God extends his territory now into Goshen God extends his kingdom there. And finally, Pharaoh says, you know, you win. Your, your God wins. We're, we're no match for him because my son's dead. See, the, the throne will be empty. And so he says, get out. And, you know, the Hebrews leave and they come to the sea. And the sea is this, um, for the Hebrew people, you realize that, that Hebrews never had any ships. The sea is this place of evil and chaos out there but when they come to the sea this time Moses is giving the authority and the power of God and his hand is the one that he raises in, in, in God's authority and the wind comes and parts the sea and you know you know the story the the man of covenant has come in the authority and the power of the kingdom and they get to the wilderness and God provides for them for a short time and then they arrive back where Moses started at the mountain of God. And there God speaks to them and says, if you'll remain faithful to the relationship we have, I will make you a treasured possession. So we're at Exodus 19. See how fast she covered 19 chapters of the Bible? Really, really good. Exodus 19, 4 to 6, 4 to 6 verses 4 to 6. He says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured, treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. A kingdom of priests. See, they were each to have this relationship with God that Moses had. They were to be the same as Moses. And that, that was God's deep desire for them. He, and he still wants that from us. This, nothing's changed here. He wants us to be a kingdom of priests. God each wants us to have this, this covenant relationship with him where it's not you and me, but it's us, you see. And God wants to make us a treasured possession and says, where you go, I go, and where I go, you go. And into that, that uh, freedom there at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, whichever you want to call it, uh, God speaks the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are to be this um, 
framework to know where the blessing and the provision is. It's to be a kind of a harness that God puts on us that keeps us close to him. Instead, uh, the Hebrew people in time turned this harness into a straitjacket, and they began to worship the law and think if we keep the law, we will become close to God, when in reality, it's if we're close to God, we will keep the law. It's quite the opposite of what they did. So I have a couple of uh, little teaching tools here to, that we're getting to. Uh, the first one is called uh, the Covenant Triangle. And this might help you kind of put your head around this and also a way that you can uh, teach it to someone else if you ever uh, need to do that. At the top is our relationship with the Father uh, results, and you see the arrow going down in our identity. Okay, We know who we are. We're joined with God. We become his people. And the greatest thing about us is that we're God's people. We may be other things in our identity, but the greatest thing is is that we're, we're him. We're his. We have... Uh, his identity through the covenant, and that that forms us, and from that obedience then flows. Okay, as you see the arrow going across, our lives reflect our identity, and our identity comes from the Father. So you might ask, well, then, if if that's the truth, if I'm supposed to just naturally obey, if I just naturally obey God based out of my relationship, then why in the world do I mess up so much? You know. Why do I have such trouble obeying God? And, you know, that's really a very easy question to answer. We forget who we are many times a day. We forget who we are. Uh, We forget whose we are. And we're constantly being told that we're not children of God. But God the Father says that if we've received the Son, that's who we are. And this is played out through the New Testament in so many places. Every time we're called a, a ch- a children of God, it's there. There are many different verses. I'll just give you one. 1 John 3, 1. So see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. That's the reality, John says, that we know that we're children of God. That's our identity, children of God. Obedience just naturally flows from that. God wants us to obey, not out of fear, but out of our identity. Then let me give another triangle that really goes with it, uh, uh, could be laid on top of it, and that's the kingdom triangle. The kingdom of God is about doing, about action, and our father is also the king. He's not just a father, but he's also a king. And God's will is, as he said, extending over the entire world, as he told them there. He says, the whole world is mine. And so this kingdom is is growing, just as we were taught to pray, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. It is growing in this world, and one day will take over the whole creation. All will be made back into God's perfect realm. But in the same way that we receive the Father's identity through covenant, we receive the King's authority. Now, this is something that we don't talk about a lot. Um, It's probably a little bit more difficult for us to get our heads around. But remember on um, the last words of Matthew, um, Jesus says, I give you all authority to his disciples. What a huge statement that is. I give you all authority. Are there in Matthew um, 16, 19, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bound on earth, bind on earth will be bound on earth. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed, or whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Authority in the name of kings sets the prisoners free. And that's just what Moses was doing. You see, before Moses could be used, he had to be a free man. He had to be completely dependent on God. And then he sent into the land of darkness to free the people. So, do you know any prisoners? Metaphorical prisoners. Do you know any prisoners? Um, maybe, maybe you're here today and we're saying, well, you know, I'm a prisoner. Uh, I, I do things that I don't want to do sometimes. Well, the answer is right here in the story. Um, 
the people who were in bondage in Egypt cried out. They cried out to God, and God heard their voice. And he says, I hear. You're mine. You're my people. Uh, you have my identity. Okay? And as, as we cry out, if we are prisoners, we, we take assurance in that, that God has prepared someone. God, God has someone prepared like Moses was, someone who will come and stand in God's authority and stand in God's power and set the prisoner free in his name. Or maybe we're saying, I'm free. Um, you know, then if you are free, do you hear the cries of someone else? Do you, do you know where the prisoners are? Do, do, do you accept your called uh, charge that you have to you to in the in the name of God in his identity under his authority and his power to be used by the king to stand in the authority of the king and to in his name set others free or you know as it appears to me perhaps we're in a desert today and uh, remember the old um, remember the the three stage plan there that we get blessed and then we get broken and then we get used and if we're in if we're in the desert today then you know we say you know I, I don't like where I am I may not be bound but I don't like where I am and the blessings of God were all about yesterday we think well if we're in that place then realize that God is preparing something for us to be used by him and he will be faithful and he has a plan. It may take a while. We may not see it just yet. But if you're in that place, do like uh, Moses did. Embrace the desert. <laughs> he went as far into Midian as he could go. Embrace that, that time in life where, where God is, is uh, humbling us. Well, let's sit in prayer for just a minute. As deep cries out